Oh, hello. Thanks for listening to the Long Game Podcast. Today, I talked to Samantha Andrel and Andrea Wilt, co-founders of Harlow, an all-in-one freelance tool that helps solopreneurs and freelancers streamline their business. As former freelancers themselves, Samantha and Andrea talked a lot about the realities of running a freelance business, especially in today's economy. We connected on a lot of the unspoken rules that go into running your own business and promoting yourself online. And we also discussed the importance of community building alongside building a product. I think you'll enjoy. Without further ado, here's Samantha and Andrea. For those listening, I'm talking to Sam and Andrea, the co-founders of Harlow today. Um, We will be talking a lot about building business from scratch, some of their career path uh, history, and then a bit about being female founders and some some growth tactics that I myself have observed from seeing you all on Twitter and stuff. So lots to talk about today. I'd love to start with just some introductions for you all to tell um, our listeners who you are and what you're all about. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Samantha, co-founder of Harlow, um, or Sam. We just had this conversation, (laughs) Sam or Samantha, I have no preference. Um, But Andrea and I have actually been working together for about nine years now, eight or nine years. I I don't know. I'm going to say eight or nine years, like the next three years. Um, (laughs) But we actually started a company called Campaign Monitor together. This was back in, you know, 2013, 2014. Andrea was the CMO there and I was her head of marketing. I was actually her first hire there. Um, Yeah. So Andrea and I actually started at Campaign Monitor, left around the same time, went and founded our freelance business interimly. Um, We called it a boutique consulting firm, but really that was just a fancy way of saying that we were freelancing, but (laughs) together. Um, And then from everything that we learned while freelancing and all of the struggles that we watched freelancers face, all of these questions that kept coming up. Um, That all led us to founding Harlow, which we actually did last year. And so now we're here and Andrea, I'll let you chime in there too. That was the perfect introduction. (laughs) That's who we are. (laughs) Yeah. And Andrea actually has freelance multiple at multiple points in her career. That is true. Yeah. This is internally was actually my third kind of foray into freelancing, Um, Mm -hmm. but each time looked so different, you know? Um, so, but I would freelance and then go in house and then go okay. back to freelancing and go back in house. And I'm just naturally an entrepreneur and enjoy building. Yeah. And so I think um, running and starting my own business is just more, it's a better fit for me. So I know, you know, freelancing looks different for everybody. A lot of people uh, consulting, consultants, contracting. How do you all define freelancing? Mm. That's a great question. I mean, I've, I feel like I've actually heard this question a lot over the past few years and specifically like, what is the difference between being a consultant or right. being a freelancer? And to me, it's just somebody who owns and operates their own business and provides mm-hmm. service services to somebody else. So whether you're a writer or a designer or a marketer, you know, even a photographer, like any of these people are a freelance business. It's just a small right. self-run business where you're offering a service. But that's in my book. Mm-hmm. How it's defined. Andrea, would you agree with that? Yeah, totally. I mean, we would always call ourselves consultants, to be honest, yeah. with you, rather than freelancers. Um, mm-hmm. Just because like the industry that we were in, the space that we were in, we were selling strategic services. It sounded a little bit more strategic than right. saying we're freelancers. Yeah, so I tell- think... Go ahead. Sorry. Well, I think even, even since Andrea and I started freelancing, so that was... I'm totally messing up my timeline, but let's call it like four or five years ago when we started freelancing together. Um, Like freelancing has come a long way since then. So when Andrew and I first started freelancing, we were really careful about how we positioned ourselves and how we positioned our services and what we offered. And we kind of like tried to package it up. It's like, we are this boutique consulting firm. We are a small agency. We can do all these things for you. But even the last couple of years, like freelancing has become so much more widely accepted Mm -hmm. and more and more people are just like, yeah, I'm a freelance writer. I'm a freelance marketer and it's well-respected and received. And I love that. So I think you know, it's even a little bit less important now how you position yourself as wh- whether you're a consultant or a freelancer or a small agency versus five years ago. I totally agree. Yeah. 
Yeah, I agree too. I, I started my career as a freelancer, as a freelance writer, um, but I remembered like chalking up a lot of how I positioned myself, the language and the labels I used yeah. to hopefully, I don't know, seem more impressive or something. I don't yeah. remember where my mind was at yeah. that time, but mm-hmm. it has been really cool to see how the the whole industry has shifted. It's become very commonplace. There's not a lot of explanation needed. Like it kind of speaks for itself. Totally. Um, so for folks that, you know, if, labeling aside, how else can people like position themselves or um, what other tactics can people use in that communication? Mm. I think it comes down to not only like how, how you want to label yourself, but also just how you want to position your services. You know, whether you want to position yourself as a freelancer who comes in and helps with very tactical items, or you want to come in and do bigger strategic projects, um, and both are awesome and great and definitely needed. Right. Um, so it's not that one's better than the other. It's just, I think it just comes down to what type of work you want to be doing. And once you've nailed that down, then you can start to position yourself to the types of companies that um, are going to have that type of demand. Totally. And one thing on top of that, that Andrea and I have actually been talking about a lot lately is this concept of like positioning yourself as selling an outcome rather than like a service or a tactic. And that's something that we've been diving into lately because it's, you know, a lot of people kind of get stuck in like, I write blog posts and I sell blog posts and I sell three blog posts for a thousand dollars. Right. And we're like, but you're not just selling a blog post. You're actually going to help them grow organic traffic. That's ultimately going to lead to increased revenue. Maybe yep. you're helping them with like branding and awareness and getting the word out there. And so that's something that Andrea and I have been chatting about a lot, especially with people early in their freelance career is yep. how can you actually package up the value and clearly articulate why somebody should hire you and what you're going to actually help them with. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think just that, whether you call yourself a freelancer or a consultant or a solopreneur or an entrepreneur, however you want to position yourself as the the term, it's really kind of further down the funnel where it really matters is how you're selling the value of what you're offering. Yeah. I, I remember when I was doing the, the guide to freelancing, I wrote for HubSpot like so many years ago. Um, there's so many questions around pricing. And I know I saw on your all's on the Harlow page, you have a lot of, of pricing information. I think that's where a lot of freelancers or contractors get caught up. Because yes. um, not only is it weird to talk about money, but you're essentially pricing yourself. Um, yes. So it's, it's just inherently a little bit uncomfortable or it takes a little bit of practice. And I remember reading about just the psychology behind pricing. And even just as a writer, which is most of my freelance experience, pricing by word versus pricing by value or pricing by deliverable, that alone can change the way that your clients kind of view what you're doing and why. So what kind of, you know, experience um, or excuse me, education do you all help with when it comes to your all's clients? Uh, I know you do a lot of that. Yeah. So I will say that I want to start off by saying your pricing and pricing strategy is going to change and going to evolve. When you first start out your first client, it's going to be really hard to have this like highly strategic (laughs) value-based pricing when you've never done it before and you're not sure Mm -hmm. what resonates. So don't be afraid to iterate and to change um, the way that you price things. I think for us, it was easiest when we were starting out to back into what our minimum hourly was. And we didn't, we did charge hourly a couple of projects, but most of our work was retainer based. But the Mm -hmm. reason why we backed into an hourly rate is it helped us to come up with what that retainer had to be. The minimum amount we had to make in order to make it viable to pay our bills. And let's not forget about paying our taxes and our health insurance because we don't have a company to pay for that anymore. (laughs) And, you know, your internet and just all of the other things that come along with running a business. So I will say starting out, I do think it's valuable for freelancers to back into what an hourly rate needs to be for them to help Mm -hmm. them figure out what would a project base price be? What would a retainer be? Or what should my hourly be? Mm -hmm. I think it gets tricky for the writers out there that charge by the word also, (laughs) because then you have to break it down into, well, how long does it take for me to write a typical blog post? Right. Yeah. I'd agree with that. Yeah. I mean, pricing is one of those like tricky, awkward conversations that has to happen. And Mm -hmm. I'm actually 
I'm really excited because I'm I'm pretty involved with the freelance community on social. I have a lot of freelancers mm-hmm. in my network. Um, and that's kind of been the case over the past few years when we've been freelancing. Before that, we were working with freelancers when we were in-house. I just mm-hmm. have a wide network of freelancers. And it is really cool to see that more and more of these conversations are taking place. Mm-hmm. I feel like, again, like five years ago, those conversations were not being had. And now people are like, hey, I'm charging this per word. Is that normal? Should I be raising my rates? Or people are like, hey, this is the retainer that I'm charging for these social media services. What do you guys think? Is that too low? Mm-hmm. Is it too high? What does it look like? Yeah. Um, so I'm pumped on that. But you know, I totally agree with like what Andrea started out with, which is your pricing is going to shift and change and evolve. Yeah. And you are very likely not going to get it right the first time, right? So I think... Yeah. I think that's a big thing is like, don't beat yourself up over it when you're first starting out and you need to figure out your pricing. Andrea and I's pricing evolved so many times. We started with one hourly rate. We raised it to a higher hourly rate before we even changed over to project and, you know, retainer based pricing. Yeah. Like in our four years of freelancing, I mean, we probably even evolved more than that, right? It probably, oh, yeah. we probably raised our prices like four or five times, mm-hmm. um, which was great. And it was, you know, every time we heard a client, heard that a client, enjoyed working with us and the project was really successful and we felt really good. We're like, we should charge more for the next one. <laughs> yeah. But that's not to say we didn't screw ourselves at times also, <laughs> you know, Absolutely. we definitely messed up and underpriced yeah. projects and we made all of the mistakes. So yeah. just to Sam's we, point, don't be upset when you make them too. Oh, it's yeah. a rite of passage. Yeah. <laughs> we, we underpriced all of the worst projects, which was unfortunate. <laughs> it's like, it was like always the hardest, most taxing projects. Yeah, we underpriced. We're like, oh, yes. oof, gotta start listening to our guts and charging more money. Yeah, yeah. I. It's funny that you say that about messing up because one of the questions I had is just like, what's one lesson you learned through through a mistake? Because honestly, in this, I mean, your careers in general, I think this is just the truth. But especially through freelancing, where there is little to no guidance and it is so bespoke to like who you are and what you're good at and between you and your client relationships, there can, it can vary. So yeah. there's going to be a lot of mistakes. And I, I, myself, I think most of what I've learned and the speed at which I've learned has been through messing up. So yeah. I think pricing and the relationship with pricing and money and communication and communicating those changes in prices, there's a lot of mistakes, which I don't even know if it's fair to call them mistakes. I think they're just lessons because I don't think totally. there's any like failures in that. I think it's just like, I am never doing that again. And I would not <laughs> know that if I didn't mess up. Yep. So totally. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, along those lines, I think another, and this is kind of in connection to what I was just talking about with pricing, but another lesson that I learned along the way was really to trust my gut when it came to taking on new clients. Yes. Yeah. And I became very, very good at looking out for red flags in early conversations. And what Andrew and I were offering was also like, it was so specific and we really Mm -hmm. needed the team to kind of look a certain way. We needed them to have enough budget. We needed them to already understand marketing. Like there were, there were all these things that we needed. And as soon as I was having a conversation with somebody and realizing that, ah, that's missing, this is probably not going to work super well. I became way better at voicing that to Andrea and saying, Hey, I don't think this is going to be a good fit for us. Like let's, let's pass this off. I would always try and convince her to take it though. <laughs> yeah. Every time. I, yeah. I have more of a scarcity mindset when it comes to That is exactly to what I was thinking. Yeah. You know? So how so, do you combat that? Samantha. I mean, well, <laughs> <laughs> everyone needs a Samantha. <laughs> they do. That's what, that's what partnerships are about. Yeah. 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 I mean, that has really been part of the beauty of our, of our long relationship, but um, uh, how do you combat it? I I don't have a good answer for that. You know, part of it is experience and you take the crappy clients and then you do start to listen to your gut a little bit more over time. Yeah. Um, But build, I think the way, another way is you start to build your network and you start to, when you finish a positive, you know, a good client relationship, you ask for a testimonial. Don't be afraid to go back to people if work is slow and say, Mm -hmm. I have an opening, you know. So all of those things will help when things do get slow. You feel like at least you have some options to go out and try and get more work. Yeah. Totally. I think also not getting so busy that you don't have time for active reflection. Because I think that was, you know, when we first started freelancing, I feel like we were just like trying to get new clients and trying to get new clients. And actually partway through our time freelancing, Andrea and I would actually have like a reflective meeting post-client where we'd say, 
okay, what did we like about this project? What did we not like about this project? Like we, right. we would meet up every once in a while and granted this was the two of us, but you can also do this as, you know, a solo human, mm-hmm. you know, we would say like, okay, let's talk about this project. What worked well? What didn't? Was there anything here that we don't want to offer in the future? Like what can we do better in terms of communication? And we kind of went through every aspect of the project and said, what's good, what's bad. And I think yeah. doing that enabled us to really understand why some projects didn't work. Cause it's not always clear, mm-hmm. right? It's not always like, it's not always super easy to pinpoint. And so we kind of made ourselves a list and we said, yeah. okay, that project didn't work because we just didn't mesh as humans. That's mm-hmm. okay. We can look out for that next time. Or that project didn't work because actually the two of us should not be offering that service. One, because we don't like it and maybe we're not the best people to do it. Maybe somebody mm-hmm. else would be a better fit. Um, so yeah, reflective, be reflective. That's a really good point. Yeah. Early on in my freelancing career, I just realized there had to be a balance of like working on the business and working in the business, working in the business, being doing the work, basically making money, but you can't do that unless you work on the business. And part of that, like you said, is that reflection period, which every business does it like solo folks or small teams or small partnerships should do it as well, especially when the the product is yourself. You Mm -hmm. can't just keep like shelling that out. Like there, you're going to run out. (laughs) Yes. So that's a really good point. I like that. Totally. So let's zoom out a bit and talk about Harlow. I'd love to learn about that light bulb moment or moments, maybe there were multiple, where you all were like, I want to build this tool or I have an idea for this tool. I'd love to learn about that and how your experience mm-hmm. may have played in. Yeah, I think so. It definitely evolved over mm-hmm. time. I wouldn't yes. say that it was like one moment where we were like, yeah. we're creating this thing and this is exactly what it's going to look like. <laughs> um, yeah. But I think, you know, over the years that we were freelancing, we were trying to figure out how to manage our own business. Mm-hmm. And we had, like I said, a large network of freelancers. And we started talking to all these different people and we're like, okay, what do you use for this? And what do you use for this? And how do you invoice? And how do you send contracts? And what does your proposal look like? And what do you, like all of these questions, right? And what we kind of started to realize is that nobody was doing the same thing. There wasn't really a fan favorite tool. You know, it wasn't like 10 of the 15 people that we asked said, I'm using X software and I can do everything in it. Right. You know, people were just kind of really scattered and everyone had the same answer where they're like, this is how I'm doing it, but it doesn't work super well, but it works it's well. And, yeah. It's clunky. Yeah. I don't really like it, but here's just how I'm doing it because it, yeah. that's how I figured out how to do it. Yeah. And so I think having those conversations over and over again, led Andrea and I to say, okay, why is there not a fan favorite tool? Why is there not a tool that people like really trust and that people want to use? And Mm -hmm. why isn't there something out there that people are saying like really positive things about? And so when Andrew and I were also in the services business, we were like, we were actively wanting to build a product because we are builders. And so we're always, this is always on our mind. We're like, what can we build next? What does it look like? You know, we're like, do we build an agency? Do we build up our freelance business to the next level? Do we build a product? And I think kind of those conversations together and the fact that, you know, we, all we did when we were freelancers was work with early stage technology companies, like basically from the ground up, helping them build their marketing strategies and figure out, you know, how to generate awareness and what money they should be spending and how they're going to generate new customers. And so all of those things just kind of came together into Harlow and Andrew, I'll let you add to that. Yeah, no, that's that's pretty much the story, but it did definitely take a long time to get there. You know, six yes. months of conversations, a lot of decks, you know, saying, oh, it could look like this, it could look like that. Yeah. Uh, until we until we finally solidified and kind of kind of came came down to Harlow. And then of course it took another another six months a year to even like bring the brand to life and and build the product and launch the yeah. product. So yeah. we've been thinking about Harlow for a year and a half now. Yeah, maybe even a little longer than that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was really... And I think, you know, one of the things when Andrew and I decided that we wanted to build a product and that we wanted to wanted it to be for freelancers to help solve mm-hmm. some of their pain points, there was also this other element that we're like, this, you know, this other thing that's really important to us is that it feels very human and mm-hmm. empathetic And the brand is going to be really important. So it's not just about the product that we're building, but it's going to be about how we interact and engage with this community. It's going to be about how we actually 
help this community, not just mm-hmm. solve their pain points through a product and software, yeah. but help solve their pain points through conversations and community and resources and listening to the community, right? Like we, you know, it, it was like, okay, we can solve these pain points this way, but how do we actually holistically like enter this market, build this product and truly help this community? And so it started here. And then it was really like, okay, this is actually, this is, this is big. This right. is yeah. bigger than we maybe anticipated, but we're it gonna is. Go, we're gonna go for it. I th- and I think part of that comes from, you know, we were working with a lot of early stage um VC funded companies, mm-hmm. which is super hyper growth, but instant growth. And so those companies, um, they're they tend to want like immediate results, which means you focus more on paid and programs that are more bottom of the funnel. And I think Samantha and I are really excited to take a little bit more of a long-term view and think about what do we want this to be in seven to 10 years? Okay, well, yeah. we want to build this community. We want these connections. These things, this is not a demand gen <laughs> type uh, tactic. You know? right. um, and so we just kind of wanted to do it our way. Yeah. Yeah. It's been interesting. And another one of my questions that you just answered is what long game are you all playing? And it sounds like the whole ethos behind Harlow is a long game. Yeah, um, absolutely. You know, and I, I first met you all, I think it was probably six months before you launched mm-hmm. Yeah, a little bit less mm-hmm. and just seeing how much legwork y'all had already done without the product being live that showed to me that the product obviously was the center of what you were doing, but it wasn't the only reason why that's what you all were building. Um, totally. And I've loved watching you all feature freelance stories, you know, Masuma and Afoma and all these people that I know and I work with. Uh-huh. Um, it's been really neat to see you all put them in the spotlight. I'm curious, you know, was that the strategy that you all had thought of from day one or how, how did that evolve when you thought about community building? Absolutely. I think, you know, when when we first isolated and said community is going to be important and an important piece of this and what we're building, we then went to, well, how do you build community? And how do you do that in an authentic and trustworthy and feel good way? And immediately we were like, well, you start out by advocating for the people already in the community and magnifying their voices. Mm-hmm. And you have to give in order to get. You know, right. you can't just... You can't just enter a community or a group of people and be like, hey, look at me, let me help you, you know, X, Y, Z. It has to be, you know what, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to do as many favors as I can. I am going to do as much for the community as possible to show that like, I really do care. I'm part of this community. We want to help. And you have to build up that trust and authority. And it is, it's a long game, right? That doesn't happen. (laughs) That doesn't happen overnight. That doesn't happen, you know, over a month. I mean, we're still, we're still at the very beginning of building our community. And it's, it is really cool to see how this community has embraced us Mm -hmm. and what they're saying about us and the product. And, you know, I kind of hear over and over again, like, Hey, you can tell that you guys really get it. You Mm -hmm. guys are actually being very helpful. You guys are actually putting freelancers in the spotlight. And that feels really good because it means what we're, we're doing, what we set out to do. Right. So what kind of visions do you have for the community in the future? You know, you said five, seven, 10 years down the line, what in a perfect world, what would you have happen? Oh my gosh, I have no idea. I haven't thought that. <laughs> I know. I don't think it, when Andrew and I think about like the next phases of Harlow, I don't, it's not like we have like, okay, three months from now we're doing this. And then right. three months from then we're doing this. But what we're trying to do is like actively listen to the community and what they Mm -hmm. want and what they're responding to and what they need and formulate like programs and projects based on that. So um, the next big big thing that we actually just kind of officially launched today um, is we're launching this thing called Office Hours. And Office Hours is just going to be a series of like free Slack Q and A's. Anyone can join and sign up and we'll cover a different topic every single time. We'll pull in someone from the freelance community who is well-versed in that topic. And we will just let freelancers ask questions for 30 minutes to an hour with us. You know, we're not sure, we're not sure if it's going to be once a week or a couple of times a month or what that's going to look like, but we're launching this. And this is just a way of us giving back to the community and saying like, okay, show up like unfiltered, ask your questions. We're here to help. If we don't have the answer, We'll be honest about that, but we'll facilitate good conversations. 
Um, so that's, yeah, we're we're really, really pumped to have this come to life. Um, so that's like the next stage Mm -hmm. of community, but then, you know, my feeling is we'll probably learn from this stage, Mm -hmm. what the next stage is going to be. Yep. Yeah. One step at a time, just like yep. two little steps in front of you that you know where you're going and kind totally. of figuring out. So when it comes to like the freelancers that you work with and, you know, you said you had a vast network and I'm sure you mm-hmm. did from before and working with folks um, in previous projects, how do you keep that network growing? Like who do you stay in touch with or how do you keep a pulse on how that network is growing? Mm. Sam does a lot of that. I mean, I will (laughs) say that I, um, so in terms of like the business structure, Samantha runs a lot of the go-to-market and the marketing side of things. And I manage a lot of the product side of the house. Mm -hmm. And so for me, like I keep a pulse on it, honestly, through support (laughs) and through our, you know, I have a lot of conversations with freelancers there saying, well, how do I do this? Or actually, this is how I run my business. And I learn new things every day through Mm -hmm. that channel. I'm less active on social, um, but I would say that's where Samantha definitely um, keeps her finger on things and and communicates with a ton of people. I see. Yeah. I I think I'm, I'm constantly like posting on social and asking questions on social and looking for responses, but also just engaging and understanding what other people are talking about and what's important to them. And, you know, one of the things... I think specifically that is important that Andrea and I had to kind of humble ourselves on early on is that the way that we ran our freelance business and the things that were important to us are not necessarily the same things that are important across the board. And so yeah. it's become very important. I mean, Andrea was just talking about support. You know, once we get a support, re- we get a support request that comes in, we're like, oh, wow, we never thought about running your business that way, but it totally makes sense for the space that you are. Like, Mm -hmm. Tell us about it. How would you do these five things? Let us hear your stories. And so I think whether it's through social or whether it's through support or whether it's through, you know, we do a lot of customer interviews and also just freelancer interviews with people that are not customers to just say, Mm -hmm. how do you run your business? What's important for you? What are the awkward questions that you have? What, where, like, what are the topics you can't find answers on or can't find good answers on? And so Mm -hmm. um, we are constantly in touch with this network of people um, and plan to continue that. We want to really be very, very hands-on so that we're never, so that we never stop learning because right, right. it also industries shift and industries yeah. shift quickly. And so you have to be very hands-on talking to the people who are doing the work. Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine the last five years since I was freelancing, how much things have changed. I mean, with technology and the mm-hmm. economy and all these things changing, like the next five to 10 years alone will probably bring about a ton of change in the industry. So, and I Absolutely. love how much the community you've built and the efforts you made have created such this, like this awesome feedback loop. So you're just primed to just continue learning. You don't have to go too far to learn. I mean, mm-hmm. you can, if you want to, but you're just getting all these questions and things you're like, Oh, this is different ways we can improve the product or the resources that we offer. That's really fascinating to me. Yeah, It's super helpful when we think about product development also to just be able to put a post out on social and say, Hey, is somebody willing to talk to us about how they want their virtual assistant to log into Harlow? You know, we're thinking mm-hmm. about multi-user right now. Yeah. And it's like, well, the way Samantha and I would approach this is probably different than the way yeah. you would approach this. And so totally. it's nice to be able to reach out and schedule those interviews and get that feedback. Yeah. yeah. And we make it very clear to everyone that we reach out to. We're like, Hey, do not sugarcoat things for us. Mm-hmm. Tell us yeah. what you like and tell us what's working well. And tell us what you don't like. And if you don't like something, tell us how you would prefer it to work (laughs) and what that looks like for you. You know, we try to like, we try to really set up a space where like, hey, give us transparent feedback. We're here to hear it. You're not going to hurt our feelings. You're actually helping us. Yes. Yeah. And that was, that's definitely a mind shift for us. You know, I think you have to, you do have to humble yourself and just be like, totally. it's the same thing as a freelancer, right? This feedback isn't about me as a human being. (laughs) Yes. It doesn't mean I'm a bad person. Yeah, all good. <laughs> yes. yes. That was that was hard, honestly, when we when we very first launched the product and launched V1. Because I mean, if you think about it, so we, we first launched product in March, at very end of March, last day of March. It was March our goal. 31st. It was it was our goal to launch in Q1. So we launched on March 31st. Um, but when we first launched the product, you know, we're like, 
oh no, like what if people don't like it? What if negative oh, support so requests come in? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, even over the last four months, like things have shifted so much. We've added so many new features. We have like the product has already grown so much. And so we have to keep reminding ourselves that like, it's okay if somebody has negative feedback about something that's going on right now, because we know yeah. we can fix it and we can solve for it. Yeah. That's actually, it's one of my va- very favorite Andrea quotes that she keeps saying to me is everything is solvable. And that's the stage that we're at. Everything really is, everything solvable. is solvable right now. Yeah. It's just a matter of resources, money, prioritization, but it is, we can, we can solve it at this yep. stage. So I think having that mindset helps us. Yeah. And keeping your ear to the ground in the way that you all are, I feel like it's truly not even possible to have someone not like the tool. They might have something they want to fix about it, but being open to that feedback, I feel like inherently solves the issue that it might helps. come up because yeah. you're like, oh, we're here to fix it for you. Or we want to hear what you might not love. Mm-hmm. And that in itself, I mean, it's nearly impossible to have anybody dislike Carlo. I feel like <laughs> Well, you're open to feedback, that. you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. And I, I mean, it also feels good. You know, the people that are using the software right now are like these early adopters who are jumping on and like, we really value them. And so yeah. we also want to make that very clear. We're like, Hey, if, yeah, again, if something's not working for you, like you have put your trust in us and trusted us to help you run your business. Mm-hmm. Let us help you run your business. What do you need? Yeah. 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 That's super interesting. I want to zoom out a bit and talk about freelancing as a whole. I'm curious if you'll have anything you believe about freelancing or like solopreneurship or contracting, anything, Mm -hmm. things you believe about it that most people might disagree with you on, or we'll go with a contrarian opinion approach. Hmm. I ask this to everybody because I feel like we've all got those underneath, (sighs) underneath our, our common opinions. Um, I guess I have hmm. some small ones, you know, like we're marketers, yeah. <laughs> Samantha and I, and one of the, one of the things that always drove me crazy is like, oh, well, you have to, you have to be really good at marketing. If you're going to be a marketer and sell marketing freelancing, then you have to be great at marketing yourself. Mm. And that one always drove me crazy because I'm terrible at marketing myself, but I was great at getting business. There are different yeah. ways to do these things. It doesn't yeah. always have to be with a beautiful website and a strong social presence. It can be with coffee dates and yep. you know a solid totally. in-person referral network events. Um, so that that one of like you have to you have to have a you know active social presence and be strong on yeah. LinkedIn if you're gonna market yourself, I think is kind of bullshit. Yeah. I, I, I love that. It's because we talked about this a lot up front. We're like, you don't have to be you don't have to have a personal brand to be a good marketer. Yeah. And you don't have to have a personal brand to be good at whatever you do, mm-hmm. whether you're a designer or a writer or a marketer or an HR consultant. I mean it's a channel in which you can generate new business and mm-hmm. gain opportunities. That's great. You can also do that a lot of different ways. And honestly, yeah. a lot of people just don't have the time to yeah. do that. Right. <laughs> and I will say even what I, I am, um, I'm more active on social now for Harlow than I ever was as an actual freelancer. Like I didn't do a good job at building my <laughs> personal brand when yeah. I was an actual freelancer, you know, we just, yeah. We generated all of our business through referrals and through relationship building and mm. these other avenues. So I, I love that you brought that up. I mean, yeah. it, it, it can look like it because the people that do have personal brands are being listened to and they're louder and, you know, mm-hmm. you see them all over the place, which is great. And that's, I mean, I'm a, also a big advocate for creating a personal brand if that's what you want to do. And if your aspirations are to like, create a course or create a podcast or, you know, do something outside of just freelancing and offering services. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. I think being like an evangelist for yourself is absolutely amazing, but it's not necessary. Yeah. I feel like it's the cherry on top, you know, and unfortunately it can't, can't compensate for poor work. Yes. So I feel like (laughs) some some folks approach it a little backwards. Yeah. Um, or think yeah. that it it measures up to the same level of of strength as a really good project or a very good skill set. Um, yeah. But yeah, I've struggled with that too, Andrea. You know, I don't. 
it's not my favorite place to be in the spotlight. And I love mm-hmm. sharing other people's stuff and maybe sharing some thoughts of my own. But most of the time I'm in the work and I forget. I'm like, oh, I should yeah. probably be posting today. So it doesn't come naturally to me either. So. Yeah. I mean, I think it's something that you actually have to prioritize. I mean, it is on my to-do list every day to like post on social three times a day. Like that is, yeah. I've built it into the structure of my work days. It's right. not, I don't, I mean, it's not, it also didn't come naturally yeah. for me. <laughs> I have to really work on it and shift my mindset yeah. and get into this, you know, different place, which I, I and I like it. I do yeah. like it. I, I like engaging. I like being active. I like having these conversations. I do thoroughly enjoy it, but it wasn't easy yeah. to get into. Yeah. I wish more people would talk about that, you know, yeah. especially on Twitter. I feel like a lot of people are like, oh, this is so simple, so easy. Like maybe it's pretty straightforward. It's not a complicated formula, yeah. but the having that natural drive or even that enjoyment of it, it if you are lacking that, it doesn't mean you know, you have to do it, you know, it's right. just totally. an option. It's something yeah. that's available to you. And it's very powerful. And like you said, it's great for building community. Um, but it has to, it has to be there. Like it has to be that genuine drive yeah, or you totally. want to practice it, you know, get better mm-hmm. at it. Yeah. And, it's actually and, anxiety producing for me. Yeah. Like <laughs> I'm yeah. with you. <laughs> I mean, creating is scary. Yeah. Right. It is, it is scary to put something out there and put yourself out there and not yes. know how someone's going to respond or when someone's going to respond negatively. Or, you know, there've been a couple of things that I posted that I totally didn't think were controversial. And I got some responses that I was like, Oh, <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't think, I didn't think about that. I understand where you're coming from, but this, Do you was, remember? this was unexpected. Do you remember um, what they were or the topics? Yeah. There was actually, um, there was one recently that sticks out in my mind and it's kind of related to one of the conversations where we were having today, um, where I was like, hey, you know, like, when did the negative connotation get removed from freelancing? I love that freelancing is so widely accepted. It makes me so happy. But like, you know, what is everyone's take on when and why freelancing is now so widely accepted? And, you know, I had someone respond that was like, freelancing has always been respected. It's always been accepted. This is like really hurtful. I've been freelancing for 10 years and I've never not been taken seriously. My mom freelanced in the eighties. And I was like, I was like, I totally hear you. I have always also thought that freelancing is respectable and you know, all of these things. I'm so sorry. I was not saying that I did not take it seriously or that others out there didn't. I was saying it, you know, in a broader sense that I thought it wasn't. And, you know, it's like, it's a misunderstanding you're putting out what, 260 characters? There's yeah. bound to be. <laughs> a lot There's lost to in be. translation. <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah. Dang. Well, yeah, it's just, it's a risk, but usually the reward is greater, I think. Yeah. I mean, yes. Clearly the way Harlow's grown and the, the number of people involved in the conversations and just knowing that Andrea and Sam are there um, for, for resources and just someone to bounce ideas off of. I think that that trumps the potential for any negative, but Andrea, yes. I still know how you, like I've been yeah. there too, you know, like anytime I post on Twitter, I have to like, I don't know, amp myself up. So definitely. And, and, then, and, then, and then walk <laughs> away. Right. Yeah. Walk yeah. away. And then you're like, should I check it? No, I don't. no. no. <laughs> so. that, that part has actually been the hardest for me is to really? like, to try to define like certain times throughout the day as the only times that I'm going to be like, checking social media and engaging because mm-hmm. it is so tempting, especially when you are posting regularly and interacting with this audience to be on all the time. But like, I, I have a lot of other things that I need to get done. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, yeah. you know, like, again, it's like, I, I felt kind of like calendar blocking into my schedule that I'm like, okay, I'm going to check it in the morning. I'm going to check it midday. I'm going to check it in the evening. And then, you know, when like at night, Twitter stays off my phone. I don't get on yeah. Twitter. I don't like, I don't do any of that actually from my phone, when I'm not by my computer, it's only when I'm like sitting down and ready for it and mm-hmm. in the right headspace. So I've had oh, to put yeah. a lot of, I've had a lot, put a lot of rules for myself. <laughs> yeah. A little bit Boundaries. of rigid. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh yeah. I've been there too. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd love to ask you all a little change in topic. What is the most impactful piece of advice you've ever been given? I know Andrea's. <laughs> I don't know if it's the most impactful, but I guess I keep coming back to it. Are you talking about one-way doors and two-way doors? You know, I am. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Our old boss, um, uh, uh, CEO of campaign monitor at the time, Alex Bard, 
he used to talk about this um, when making decisions. Is it a one-way door or a two-way two -way door? And I think that has been very helpful in this season of life right now. Mm -hmm. Like as we're building Harlow and there's so much to do where we're trying to do 20 things at once, mm -hmm. you know, we don't always agree, um, you know, okay, well, is this a one-way door or two-way door? Can we make this decision and change course afterwards? Or is it something that it's going to take a lot of time, money, energy to change course afterwards? Mm -hmm. um, I think that has helped us with our decision-making um, and like keeping our momentum going and also just the balance between the two of us. Mm -hmm. So if Samantha's feeling super like strongly about something that I disagree with, if it's a two-way door and she feels strongly about it, okay, run with it. Let's, you know, and same right. thing with me, you know, if she disagrees, but it's like, all right, well, we can always come back and, and adjust this later, mm -hmm. change course. Then we usually defer to the person who feels the most um, strongly about it. Yeah. That's awesome. totally. I love that piece of advice. We do use it often, especially yes. <laughs> when we're like, when we're outlining big programs and like, I mean, a lot of the stuff that we are doing can work in a lot of different ways. There's not, mm. it's kind of like freelancing in general, you know, <laughs> it's like, you can work in a lot of different ways. You can build a community in a lot of different ways. You can build a product in a lot of different ways. You can prioritize things a lot of different ways. So, but you have to, you have to take steps and you have to go down a path. At some point. Yeah, so you just have to like, move forward. You right. know, I think mm -hmm. that's we like. There's a tendency, especially um, for uh, for me, when I'm in house, to have like inertia. You know, like oh, I'm making this decision, what is it going to mean? And thankfully for us, since we're so tiny, it's like huh, what it means is we're going to see what happens, right? <laughs> and mm -hmm. then we'll pivot if we need to. Yes, um, but. Yeah. So, so I think it allows us to adjust and change course as needed. Yeah. I hear you yeah. on that shift in mindset going in-house and then back out. I've been mm -hmm. there too. And man, it's, even if you're doing the same job function, it's like a whole different approach. I mean, I yes. love the freedom Absolutely. of having your own thing. There's obviously more consequences, but being able to be like, eh, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> it takes a lot of practice when you like go back and forth. So I hear you on that, Andrea. Samantha, like what about your advice? You know, I think this might have actually also like, this might have come from Andrea at some point. I can't quite remember. Um, <laughs> oh, <but dear. laughs> I, <laughs> no, it's good advice. And it's actually helped me a lot. Um, one of the things that I was told early on is that like, you don't always have to have an answer. And that was really hard for me. I moved into like a management role in house really early on in my career, I think I was like 23 or 24 and started wow. managing people and started to like, get into more of these like senior roles. And I felt like because I was young and because I was in this position, I feel like I had a little bit of imposter syndrome and I feel like I needed to have an answer when somebody asked me a question, especially when it was somebody more senior than I. Right. Mm -hmm. So right. I feel like if I was in a meeting and somebody was like, well, what should we do about this? And it was in my you know field or my area of the business. I feel like I needed to have an answer, but the truth is like that can actually be really negative, right? Like coming up with an answer when you haven't actually been thoughtful in your yeah. approach or you haven't like taken a step back to think holistically about the situation, what's actually like the right path um, can actually be really negative yeah. <laughs> um, and can also make you come off as very hypocritical and like all these other things, right? And so yeah. I think just like moving forward with, you don't always have to have an answer. And if you don't have the answer, it's perfectly okay to say, I don't know the answer to that right now, but let me take a step back and do some thinking and get back to you or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, that's been really impactful for me and the way that I do deal with like business and my relationships in companies, you know, whether it's in-house or freelancers that we're working with. Um, it's just, it's helped me a lot to just shift my mindset. Yeah. I feel, I'm not sure about you all, but I feel like we've all been in tech for a bit and I just feel like it's so fast. You know, yes, like there's yes. a lot of speed to it. Even I'm sure with Harlow, like there's an element of like, we want to do this quicker than, than not. Yeah. <laughs> and I feel like that speed puts a lot of pressure on knowing things right away. And I, yes. I, some of this is chalked up to my perfectionist tendencies. I'm not sure if you all share in those at all. Um, but I feel like I really have to think about stuff for a bit or get a good grip on something before mm -hmm. it's an answer that, that I stand by. And I felt that same pressure of like, 
someone asks you something and you're like, oh my gosh, I need to know this right now. I think it goes back to my days in school where I like didn't, I didn't always want to raise my hand. Um, totally. But no, I, I love that. And just being able to trust, like taking time is not bad. You know, you can right. still fast, and, but take time to think through stuff, especially if it's a one-way door. So yes. yeah. <laughs> I'm connecting the dots here. now. I know. <laughs> totally. I got it. I got a good grip. Yeah. Um, Awesome. Well, you know, I, that's everything I have with you all today. I'm, I've loved officially meeting you, seeing your partnership, seeing your dynamic is very inspiring. Um, is there anything you'd like to tell our listeners about Harlow or what you all have coming up? Well, I guess, I I guess I really haven't explained what Harlow is to anybody who's listening (laughs) and doesn't know, um, you might've somehow caught on, but, um, so Harlow is actually an all-in-one freelance tool. Um, it's built to help freelancers. So think specifically like writers and designers and Mm -hmm. HR consultants, PR consultants, social media consultants. Um, it's built to help those people manage their business. So everything from proposals and contracts and locking in new clients all the way through invoicing and getting paid and understanding your finances. So Mm -hmm. in between there's obviously client management, task management, time tracking, all of that organizational piece. Um, So that's what Harlow is. Um, We, like I said, we launched back in March. We're growing quickly. We're taking a lot of feedback from our community. Um, It's been a really wonderful journey, but yeah, if you, if you want to, and you're a freelancer or a solopreneur and you want to find out more, um, you can go to meetharlow.com. That's the website where the product lives, where all of the resources are. Um, And we, like we've been talking about, are also super active on social. So <laughs> you can um, find me on social. It's just at Samantha Anderl, or you can find Harlow on social. It's meet Harlow um, across all of these different platforms. So I think that's it for me. Andrea, yeah. anything you want to add? Yeah, I would say if you're thinking about freelancing or you've got, you're have got you thinking about how you grow your freelance career, you should also um, join us for office hours. Mm-hmm. Our first yes. one is coming up on, I think it's the 17th. It's August right, 17th. Sam? Yep. Which this episode will probably come out after our first office hours, but we'll have another, we will yeah. have <laughs> many, many more. Yes. yes. Awesome. Well, thank you all for joining me today. Yeah. Thanks this for having us. This was fun. Awesome.